Hello everyone and a very, very warm welcome to all of you joining the session today. It's absolutely fantastic to see so many of you with us. My name is Emma Grover, I'm the Professional Development Lead here at the Royal College of Occupational Therapists. Now we are recording this session today and we'll share both a recorded version of the webinar and a copy of the slides on our website uh, following the event, so a little bit later on in the month. We'll have time for questions and answers at the end, and you can submit your questions using the question and answer function as we move through the session today. Now, there's been a slight change to um, the plan, and Anne McKean, who is the Professional Advisory Service Manager at RCOT, isn't able to join us today. So I'll do my best to cover Anne's parts um, to the best of my ability. And I'm sorry to say that it means you'll be hearing a lot more from me than was originally planned. And um, I'm absolutely delighted to say that we're gonna be joined by two of our colleagues from the Health and Care Professions Council today. So Natalie and Florence are both here and they're gonna be sharing their expertise with us. Um, Natalie is the registration manager at HCPC and Florence is a professional liaison consultant in Northern Ireland. Uh, we thought it might be quite nice to share with you that although Anne isn't here, Anne and I and Florence are actually HCPC registrants just like you. Anne and I are both occupational therapists and you'll hear from Florence a little bit later. But what it means is this topic applies to us as much as it does to you and we could be selected for audit later this year as well. So um, it's really good to be on this journey together. The, I'd say that the main and overarching aim for today is really around uh, giving us all some reassurance and supporting all of us to feel more prepared for the upcoming audit. And we're going to do this by uh, gaining a better understanding of the re-registration and audit process and um, some tips on how to complete a CPD profile. One of our members has also shared what it's like to be audited, so you'll hear that as well today. And you'll learn how we plan to continue to support our members in this period as we come up to audit and then throughout that um, August to October period. We have a bit of time for some reflection during the session today and as I mentioned earlier we'll have questions and answers at the end. But if anyone is sitting here thinking I don't even really have a CPD record, I'm feeling completely and utterly unprepared, um, I really hope I don't get selected for audit, then I'd, I'd say that the chances are you're probably not alone in that and attending the session today is taking a step to make a difference to that, um, which is which is great. Now, before we get really stuck into the session and before we hear from our colleagues from HCPC, we wanted to start off by checking in to see how everyone feels uh, about the HCPC CPD audit. How does the thought of getting that email make you feel? If you want to get involved with this, there's two ways you can do that. You can either scan the QR code that you can see on the screen now um, using a mobile device, or you can go to slido.com and enter the code 8474830 that you can see on the screen there. Now, it should allow you to submit more than one answer if you want to. And we're not going to share the live results right now during the webinar, but we will upload the results from this um, as a resource to go alongside the recording of the webinar. So I'm just going to pause for a very short time um, to allow some of you to scan that and take part. And um, you'll be pleased to hear that I'll soon be handing over to HCPC. This uh, Slido will remain open, so if it's taking you a little while to join it or you aren't sure how you feel and you want some time to think about that, then you can continue to add to it as we move through the webinar. So I don't want to keep you waiting any longer to hear from HCPC, so Florence, it's over to you. Thank you, Emma. Um... We could move the, the slide. So hello everybody. Um, so my name is Florence, as you've heard there, and I am a registrant like yourself, uh, but as a physiotherapist, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say that or not, um, amongst uh, my OT colleagues. Um, I've over 25 years of experience working in the NHS. Um, 
but you know what I have also experienced being picked for a CPD audit so I'm right there with you uh, I'm now part of the professional liaison team in the ATPC um, and really our remit there is to support registrants like yourselves to really embed and achieve high professional standards in all that you do which I know that you do uh, and I'm joined today by my colleague um, Natalie Berry, who knows everything there is to know about CPD and audit. So you're going to hear from her in just a moment. But I just wanted to say a big thank you actually to you for coming along today and for your eagerness to learn about CPD and audit, because it really demonstrates to us that desire to remain on our register, which is wonderful. Uh, we really appreciate the work that you're doing, whatever capacity that's in. You may be NHS, you may be private practice or charities or, or somewhere else. So thank you for that. Uh, next slide, please. As a registrant myself, I actually understand that slight on ease that subconsciously creeps in when you know the regulator is in the room. Uh, but what might help is if you put on another hat on top of your registrant's hat and either maybe imagine or remember what it's like to be a patient or a carer yourself. And just how reassuring it was then to know that your doctor or your nurse or your AHP was regulated. In other words, you were sure that they would regularly take the time to reflect on their current knowledge, figure out where their gaps were, and just made sure that they were up to date with the evidence. And then they actually put that into practice, what they'd been learning. And that's what regulation does. That's what the regulator does. We just reassure you, the public, that you are safe in the hands of your own colleagues whenever you're caring for them. Next slide, please. So our regulation really um, is involved in all stages of your career. So as a student, the training program that you completed was quality assured against our standards, which is why when you successfully completed, uh, you were able to register with us. And then we obviously maintain and publish an accurate register of professionals, that's including yourself, um, uh, if you're registered with us. And then you stay registered by meeting the appropriate standards that we've set. And if you don't, I um, have to say only a tiny percentage of our register don't, but if there is a fitness to practice concern, then we will take the appropriate proportionate action to protect the public when we need to. Next slide, please. So our standards form the foundation for how we regulate and really explain what we expect of our registrants and education training programs. So as you know, to remain registered with us, you need to declare in a two yearly cycle that you meet our various standards, which you'll see shown here. So we've got the CPD standards, which you're going to know even more about shortly. Look at the standards of conduct, performance and ethics, uh, which probably are my favourite, which state how we expect our registrants to behave. And then we've got your standards of proficiency, which are, will be specific to you as OTs. Next slide, please. So these standards of proficiency are the baseline of what knowledge we expect you to have in order to practice safely and effectively and ex explain to the public what they should expect of an HCPC registrant. Next slide. And I'm sure probably a lot of you have heard that these have been revised recently. They've been updated after a long process, which began way back in 2020. Um, and it really was to reflect developments in practice since they were last reviewed in 2013. Um, they're designed to promote a more positive and inclusive working environment, which we hope will help to reduce the number of unnecessary fitness to practice proceedings that registrants undergo. So it's vital that you do become familiar with the changes um, which come into effect in September um, this year. And you can see the five key areas of change here. And you can go onto our website and download the OT revised. Um, standards of proficiency there there's also a document in there called changes which highlight what they are so you'll see some of the key changes in the wording and um, there's a there's really a move away from a passive understanding of the standards towards a much more active implementation of them so for example you can see the very first standard here used to read be able to practice safely and effectively within their scope of practice but it now reads practice safely and effectively so I was thinking it's a wee bit like my husband is able to throw his smelly socks into the wash basket but unless he actually does it this ability is no good to me and as we approach September we will be releasing information and videos and case studies uh, as well as running some online events that will raise awareness and help um, you to prepare for that and we're in the middle of presenting five separate webinars actually which cover the main themes of the updates 
as shown here. And there is still time to register for some of these if you haven't already done so. And if you miss any, they will be recorded and available on our website. So as you approach renewal and potentially audit, you may have included looking at the new standards maybe as part of your CPD. Um, and your practice for the last two years will have been based on your current standards um, and your CPD will be reflecting those standards, um, not, not the new ones. So after today, if you haven't already done so, sorry, the next slide. Sorry, I forgot to, to, to tell you, Emma, to move on to the next slide. So we'll go to the next one again there. Thank you. Um, so after today, if you haven't already done so, it would be important that you go away and read the new standards. Check out all the resources that are available um, about them, both from our website, but also our YouTube channel and your professional body will have some information to start using them in your practice. Do a gap analysis, and I'll, I'll talk about that just at the end, um, and allow them to direct your, your CPD, which Natalie is going to tell you all about now. So, Natalie. Thank you, Florence. Thank you, Emma. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll just introduce myself. So my name's Natalie Berry. Um, so I am the odd one out here. I'm, I'm not a registrant. However, I do manage the um, continuing professional development process, which I'll refer to as CPD throughout my presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just to recap what I'll be talking about today, my main aim today is I know many of you may be anxious about CPD um, and there may be some things that you've heard that aren't true or just to kind of clarify, you know, if you are selected exactly what, what you'll need to do. So I'll just touch upon obviously who we are as the Health and Care Professions Council, which I'm, I'm sure most of you are aware, um, but I'll also discuss what exactly is CPD. Um, and I'll touch upon our five CPD standards. And then the bulk of my presentation will be around just reassuring you if you are selected, what that actually means and what you'll need to do. And I'll also discuss with you and share with you the outcomes from the last um, occupational therapist uh, CPD audit. Just hopefully again, there's some reassurance, see some really positive results in there. And I'll also speak to you about deferral if you're not able to submit your CPD if selected. Next slide, please. Um, so just briefly, who, who are we? Um, so we are independent UK-wide statutory regulator. So obviously we do play a different role uh, from the Royal College of OTs um, as a regulator. However, we do work very closely and obviously do, do presentations and events like this to reassure um, the members. Um, we do derive our powers from the Health Professions Order 2001. And essentially, as mentioned previously, you know, we are here to safeguard um, health and wellbeing and just here to naturally protect the public. Um, we are overseeing, so we do have a, what I call the regulators of the regulators, which is the Professional Standards Authority, who is the PSA. So that's just a brief kind of overview of who we are and what we do. Next slide, please. Um, so we are a multi-profession regulator, which um, I'm sure many of you are aware. So we have 15 different professions, including um, occupational therapists, which I'll refer to as OT throughout my presentation, just to shorten things down in the presentation. But um, as you'll see here, your renewal opens on the 1st of August this year, and the deadline for your renewal is the 31st of October this year. So that's a three month window. Uh, for those of you that have been on the register sometime, you'll be familiar with how obviously the renewal process works. But what also happens alongside in parallel, which is a different process to renewal, is the CPD selection. Um, and we will select two and a half percent randomly of the OT profession um, and obviously notify you that you've been selected. And that runs in parallel with the renewal. So the deadline would be the same as the renewal deadline. Um, next slide, please. So just briefly, Florence touched upon obviously the standards. So what makes up the register? Now, you know, as mentioned, Florence did say the standards of education and training, which we use against obviously our approved programs. And if you come on the register via UK approved course route, um, you know, these are the standards that, that you would have to meet when completing the course. Um, in terms of our standards of proficiency, obviously we have different standards of proficiency for each profession. Um, and again, in September, we have got new standards of proficiency coming in. Just to point out, because I know there's been a bit of confusion, some questions around this. If you are selected for audit, 
you're actually um, going to be assessed against the CPD standards, which have remained the same. So we have five CPD standards, which I will go through with you in more detail. And then we have the standards of conduct, performance and ethics, um, which as Florence mentioned, is what we kind of expect of you as a professional. So these are the standards that make up our register. Next slide, please. Okay, so what, what is CPD? Um, I like to put this slide in because we do get asked this question quite a bit, you know, what is deemed a CPD? I mean, essentially the onus is on you as a, a registrant to ensure that you are keeping your skills and knowledge up to date. And that is to ensure continued fitness to practice, but also to ensure that you are drawn on your skills and knowledge and developing within your role. Because as you know, from when you qualified to now, things can change all the time. And it's about keeping those skills and knowledge up to date within your current or future scope of practice. Um, it is outcomes based, so we don't do points and hours, and it is self-directed and self-managed with no kind of official sign-off, which I'll go into in a bit more detail about again, when you're selected, what happens. But the onus is a lot on about you thinking about what CPD is relevant to you and what you could learn from the CP that, CPD that you're doing. And also, even if you do an activity and you don't actually learn from it and you thought maybe you did there's still reflection there that you can learn from um next slide please so what i'm going to do what i thought would be useful and hopefully reassuring for you all is go through each of the standards the cpd standards as mentioned there are five standards and actually relate them to if you are selected for cpd what you'd actually need to do because i think a lot of the anxiety come from well, what do i do if i'm selected and we get many questions about that so hopefully this this approach will help you feel reassured and just kind of a bit more clarity on what you'd need to do. So standard one, maintain a continuous up to date and accurate record of your CPD activities. Now, the best advice I can give you is that if you are selected, the um, what we need is your activities throughout that two year um, renewal, that two year period of your registration. And what I would say is, I don't know about you, but I don't remember what I done kind of last week, never mind 18 months ago. So it's really important that you note your CPD. Now, I just want to stress there's no right or wrong way of noting down your CPD. Some of you may um, be signed up to a CPD app, for example, and some may just use a simple Excel spreadsheet. There is absolutely no right or wrong way of doing this. Um, next slide, please. So I just wanted to give you an example. I mean, essentially what you just want is just a simple dated list. So, you know, your learning activity um, and kind of the date that you've done it on or the range of date, if it was between, you know, a start and end date, just a level of detail that is enough for you to remember what your CPD was and maybe some just reflection points from it as well and what you learn. Um, and as I've put there, there's no perfect way to record your CPD. We don't endorse any of the online CPD apps, but, you know, some of them I know are very useful for registrants. And I know the professional bodies also do sometimes offer platforms that allows you to log your CPD. If you are selected for CPD, we have an online system ourselves at the HCPC. And what we would ask for when you are selected is to upload or input manually your dated list so if you are using a system that you could easily upload say a pdf or a word document or excel whatever it is into our system if you are selected that will take away a lot of that stress of trying to panic and gather all your cpd at the same time and you know my biggest advice and what i've seen over the years is it honestly does cut down a lot of stress if you do just try and keep your up-to-date list now i know you're very, you know, busy health, health professionals and I know how busy things can be. So, you know, even if it is a point of maybe once a month, just noting down what you've been doing and just spending a bit of time doing that, I, I honestly can say it will save you a lot of stress if you are selected. Um, next slide, please. So standard two is demonstrate that essentially your CPD activities are a mixture of learning activities relevant to your current or future practice. Um, so what we need to see here is, you know, it's all good and well going on really nice formal training courses, for example. There's only so much you can learn from a, just one type of learning. So we want to see a mixture of learning. So if we just go into the next slide, please. I've just put down some examples here, but I have to say on the website, we have a much, much more extensive list. 
this is just some that I've pulled together just for the presentation to give you an idea. So work-based learning, professional activities, formal and educational, self-directed and other. So work-based learning could be things like in-service training, reflective practice, work shadowing. Um, professional activity could be, you know, mentoring, professional body involvement. I mean, obviously attending today is part of your CPD. So, you know, absolutely do mention this if you are selected for CPD. And then we have formal and educational, which is the one that always kind of people think is always the CPD, you know, the courses, the conferences and things like that. But actually, that's just one type of CPD. Um, Self-directed learning. So that could be, you know, Internet searches, books, reading journals. And then we're mindful that there could be other things. And again, this is not an extensive list. And we have a much more detailed list on our website as well, just to get you thinking. Um, what I found when speaking to registrants is that sometimes they're doing CPD and don't actually realise they're doing CPD until they actually sit down and think about, well, actually, I've done this and I learned something from it and it helped me within my role, my service user. So really have a think about what you're doing um, in your day to day and what could be deemed as CPD. Uh, next slide, please. So standards three and four, I've just grouped together here. Essentially, these are seek to ensure that your CPD has contributed to the quality of your practice and service delivery, and also to ensure that the CPD that you're doing benefits your service user. So to put in simple terms, basically the CPD that you're doing is benefiting you within your profession and your development and also your service user. Now, the only way you're going to know if it is, is obviously reflecting on your CPD. Um, and what I would say is that the question does come up quite a lot about, well, who's my service user? So I essentially just say anyone that is affected by your work or practice is your service user. So if you are seeing patients, for example, then that would be your service user. But if you're, you know, maybe a lecturer in academia, then your students would be your service user. And um, so really think about and you could have more than one service user as well. So really think about who your service user is you know if you're a manager for example again it could be your staff that obviously report into you as well as maybe patients or clients that you're seeing so again just really think you know who is affected by my practice um so that that's what we deem as a service user and uh, next slide please um, so what we ask for, if you are selected, um, is that obviously we want to see that dated list. We also want, and within that data list, we will be able to see if there's a mixture of CPD. And then obviously standards three and four is around you reflecting on your CPD. And we don't want you to reflect on every single piece of CPD you've done in two years, because we know that will take you a very long time and you'll be there forever and it'd be a very big profile. So we actually only want you to pick up kind of four to six pieces of CPD that you've done, a mixture I would recommend. So maybe, you know, one type of formal learning, some self-directed, for example, and reflect on these. Really think about how did this benefit me? How did it benefit my service user? And ask yourself those questions. What did I learn? Did I learn anything? Did it change my practice? Did it, did it make me do things differently? Did, you know, really think about and just ask yourself those thought-provoking questions um, in order to demonstrate you meet standards three and four. And then what we want to see as part of that is that you've provided evidence. Now, we don't want, it's not evidence kind of in the court of law, just to reassure you. And also, we only want evidence for the um, four to six CPD activities that you have, you know, said that you're going to talk about. Um, so things like if you put together a presentation, for example, um, it could be your PowerPoint slides or the research that went into your presentation, you could provide, for example, attending today, you know, your evidence could be, um, the slides will be shared with you, so it could be your notes around what you've learned, obviously confirmation that you've attended. Don't, you know, we don't need to worry too much about kind of shiny certificates or anything like that. It's just confirming attendance and what you've kind of learned from, from the presentation. Um, and even just things like, you know, materials showing you've reflected and evaluated your own work. So kind of even if it's just your personal development plans, and it could be a team meeting that you've had that you have taken an action from and had to do some development from that. So these are types of evidence. But again, I've just picked out a few here, but we do have a really much more extensive list on our website just to give you some ideas of what's deemed as evidence. And um, next slide, please. OK, so standard five essentially is the final CPD standard, and it simply is submitting your profile. So if you are selected for audit, 
um, you do need to submit a CBD profile unless you have grounds, which I'll go into a little bit later in the presentation, um, where you could maybe defer your audit. Um, again, my biggest word of advice is please don't bury your head in the sand. Don't ignore us. Don't avoid us um, because essentially we are here to support you. If you are selected and you need support from us, please do reach out. Um, and essentially, we, like I've mentioned, we do set two and a half percent randomly. So the only exceptions really, if you've newly joined the register or you've kind of readmitted back on, you have to be on the register continuously for two years before we would select you for audit um, because it would not be very fair to select you if you have not been on. So, um, and then if you were in a fit, fitness to practice um, investigation, for example, we wouldn't have you in the, the random selection pool because that would take priority. So everyone else is kind of open to being selected and um, you can be selected more than once because it's for a different two year period. Um, so yeah, we have had that, but it's very rare because obviously it's a very random selection, which I have completely no involvement in and it's just done randomized kind of on the computer. Um, and then those that are selected for audit do need to submit a profile by the end of the renewal period. So it's the same deadline. Um, so October, the end of October, um, and profiles are reviewed by HCPC partners, which are our CPD assessors. Um, and just to reassure you again, is that at least one of those assessors will be an occupational therapist. Um, because we have generic CPD standards across 15 different professions, we do um, we are able to pair up assessors with different professions. So for example, it could be an occupational therapist and a physiotherapist that assess your profile, but more than likely it's normally two occupational therapists. So I know sometimes registrants are reassured to know that their profile is actually being looked at from someone else the same part of the register as them and that are registered. And our assessors can actually be selected for CPD as well, which has, has happened in the past as well. Obviously they can't assess their own profile because that'd be absolutely not fair. So. Um, next slide, please. So just to kind of bring this all together for you, um, if you are selected, you need to submit a CPD profile. That CPD profile is made up of four components and it is an online system. Um, I know, for, for example, when Florence um, went through CPD, we discussed that, you know, it was the old system of very old fashioned submit paper in um, or send an email of kind of, you know, 10 attachments and plus. So it was very not a very sophisticated system. We have moved online, which is much better. And so basically it's still, it's the same registration system that you would use if you are renewing. And if you've been selected for CPD, there is a part in there that will show you where you can do your profile. So that profile is made up of four parts. So one being your list of activities as mentioned. So again, you could simply upload your list of activities. So if you have that ready there, that is really, quite straightforward. So that's why I really encourage you to keep that list of CPD. You can also manually input your CPD list into our system as well, which is absolutely fine. Um, some of your recent work in the last two years. So really what you're doing here, you're telling the assessors who you are, what you do, what your job role is, who your service users are, and really painting a picture to them because they're not going to know who you are and they really would, you know, need that information in order to assess your profile. And then you're gonna go on to the statement of standards. And what I just wanna mention here, I've kind of put there 500 words for your summary, 1500 for your statement, but that's just in a box. Please don't feel that you have to strictly stick to that. I've, I've put that in there because we do get asked quite a lot, kind of how much are you looking for from, from me? So we kind of just put that in there to give you an idea, but I just want to really point out that the profile, it's, it's more about the quality than the quantity. So just really think about what you're putting into your profile is selected. So this statement of how, stand, how you've met the standards. So as mentioned, you're going to pick four to six of your CT activities from your list of activities that you've uploaded. And again, that would need to be a mixture. So don't just pick kind of, you know, six different types of formal learning courses that you've done, really pick out a mixture to talk about. And then you're going to reflect on them. So that's where you're gonna start asking yourself the questions. What did I learn? Um, have I learned anything from it? You know, how did it benefit my service user? Really start thinking about that reflection. And then for those four to six activities, you're then going to upload your evidence, which will be the, the, the standard, well, the fourth part of the profile. 
Um, and that would only be again for the four to six. So hopefully now that I've broken that down, that really simplifies um, the process because I think sometimes people find it quite overwhelming and daunting because they think it's this massive profile with tons of work but actually when you kind of break it into these four components it's actually not that much um what I would say is so if we just recap so list of activities that's going to show that you meet standard one your summary of recent work so that the assessors are obviously aware of your scope of practice um, and then you're going to do your statement of how standards which would then demonstrate you meet standards three and four and also from your list of activities the assessors will see if you meet standard two of having a mixture of activities and then obviously submitting your profile with evidence um, would meet standard five so hopefully you can see it's it's quite a straightforward process hopefully you think the same so next slide please in the pandemic and I am mindful that obviously if you are selected, you're looking back at the last two years and there was still quite a bit of fallout from obviously the pandemic and COVID during those times. So I've kept this in because I thought it would still be helpful. And there's also a blog that I've written around this and um, which we will be sharing all the links to the relevant CPD um, parts of our website and also the blog that I've written. But essentially, you know, during that time, it may be that you weren't able to maybe do things like as many formal courses, and we understand that. So it could be that there was more self-directed learning happening. That's absolutely fine. And there may be things you've done during the pandemic or, you know, as a fallout of from coming out of the pandemic that was slightly different to what you were doing before. But again, this could all feed into your CPD. Um, don't struggle to fill in the COVID gaps. And what I mean by that is that if there are any gaps larger than three consecutive months, they must be explained to the assessors. And if they are due related to kind of COVID reasons or the pandemic or any fallout from that, do explain that in your profile. Um, the assessors will take that in, on board and into account when looking at your profile. Um, please don't record all your work activities. So you really need to think about the difference between your day to day work activities these what CPD is because attending a team meeting for example weekly would not be deemed a CPD however within that team meeting if you did maybe some work reflection within the team meeting or there may be an activity that you've done within the team meeting that has promoted your CPD then do talk about that but you really need to think about the difference of just your day-to-day -day work these what your CPD is um, and just show your CPD standards, how, how you meet those standards clearly. Um, so yeah, just as I say, if you ever do need support, you can obviously reach out to us, but we are mindful that, that you know, we did go through very challenging times and that naturally, you know, has affected people. So by all means, if there are gaps and things like that, please do mention them, you know, and the assessors will take that on board. Uh, next slide, please. So I just thought I'd do a, very basic graph for you of um, the process which I discussed earlier. So you will go into your renewal on the 1st of August, the renewal window opens. And that is also when this selection takes place for CPD. The communication for renewal and CPD is sent separately um, and they are both sent by email. So if you are selected for CPD, that is a separate email to the renewal, what, the renewal email that invites you to renew your, your registration. Um, we normally say that goes out within about 10 working days of the renewal window opening, but it normally does go out sooner um, because we're doing things via email rather than letter now. So we don't we no longer send letters um, of your CPD um, if you've been selected. So um, what I what, what I just wanted to demonstrate here is that essentially um, you're registering, you have your renewal and you have your CPD. What I would definitely recommend is that you renew your registration as quickly as possible to ensure you do not fall off the register. Um, and then you'll have your kind of CPD running in parallel, but that might take you a little bit more time. That's absolutely fine. But I recommend you do renew your registration first and foremost, as that's a much more straightforward and quicker process and um, while doing your, your CPD. And then when you do submit your CPD, you will remain registered um, throughout the time obviously of you being having your registration assessed. Sorry, your CPD assessed. Next slide, please. Okay, so I did mention this earlier, so deferrals. So we are mindful that sometimes um, you may not be in a position to complete the audit if selected, and it can obviously come as a surprise. 
So it may be within the two year period you were on maternity leave or you may have had long term sickness or bereavement. If this is the case, you can submit a deferral request via the online system. Um, but you will need to upload evidence. Um, so, for example, if you were on maternity leave, something like a MAP B1 certificate would be absolutely fine. Um, or long term sickness, maybe something from your, your doctors or health provider or even a supporting letter from your, your employer would be fine. And then these will be looked at on an individual basis. Um, being busy is not deemed a reason for deferral um, and would normally be rejected. So please do bear that in mind. Um, we are flexible and obviously we do give a three month period, which is a sufficient amount of time. But if you feel like you might need more time, that is something you can obviously email us and contact us and we can look at maybe providing you with an extension if needed and just your reasons why. So again, just don't bury your head in the sand. If you need support or you're struggling, please do reach out to us and we can reach some kind of solution with you to ensure that we support you in any way that we can. Next slide, please. So I just thought I'd provide some outcomes for um, occupational therapists um, in the last audit. So those that were selected in 2021. And as you will see here, um, nearly seven, 75% were um, accepted, which means they demonstrated they met the standards. Um, around 18% were deferred. So what I've just discussed for various different reasons, they would have deferred their, their CPD, which means they will actually be getting picked up in this audit coming up in August. Um, did not renew means that they didn't renew their registration and ultimately came off the register. Um, voluntary dereg means that they volunteered to come off the register for different reasons. It could have been retirement or moving outside of the UK, etc. cetera. Um, none were removed, um, which is really good news. And outstanding, we have two. And what that normally means is that it may be that someone's gone into an FTP case after they were selected, which will take precedence. So we have to hold the CPD audit at that time. Um, in regards to removal, just to ensure you, there's two reasons why you'd be removed from the register for CPD reasons. So the first one is non-engagement. And this is why I say it's really important, first of all, that you keep your contact details and your email address up to date with us. And secondly, um, that you engage with the process. Please do not struggle in silence. Please do not bury your head in the sand. Please do reach out to us. Um, and what I would say is it does take quite a lot of time um, we will send chasers, we will send reminders, it's not kind of that deadline and then you're removed or anything like that. There are chasers sent out. So it's only when it's got to really exceptional circumstances where there's no engagement whatsoever from the registrant that we would go to a removal. But as you can see, that's not been the case in the last audit, which is really good. And the other reason would be not meeting the CPD standards. So again, to reassure you, if you are selected and there are shortfalls in you meeting the standards, that's, that's fine because the assessors will come back and in their record of assessment online system, they will say to you what the shortfalls are and then you, you're given the opportunity to submit further information. So um, again, hopefully that reassures you because you're given several opportunities and actually in some cases, which are very exceptional, if it's really shown that a resident cannot meet the standards despite several opportunities of further information, we can sometimes give them something called further time, which is when we allow them to go away for an additional three months to carry out their CPD, because our aim is not to remove you from the register. We, we understand this is your career and your livelihood, and that's not what we want to do. The aim is to ensure that the registrant understands that they need to do their CPD and that the CPD is being carried out because ultimately we are here to protect the public as mentioned at the beginning. Next slide, please. Um, so we have tons of resource on our website um, and we will be sending out a document with a lot of relevant links on it, which would be really helpful for you, including the blog I mentioned. Um, and also, you know, this, this report, this presentation is being recorded as well, which will be shared. And just on our website, we have a list of uh, CPD activities, the different types of evidence. We have sample profiles. Uh, we have videos of how to use the online systems, the more practical side if you are selected. And then we have the CPD and your registration booklet, which is kind of everything to do with CPD or singing or dancing booklet of just absolutely everything you need to know. So please do take a look at the CPD part of our website if you haven't done so already. Next slide, please. So just to recap kind of things to remember. So 
those that are selected for CBT will receive a separate um, email to the renewal email. So please be mindful of that. And again, please ensure you have your email address up to date with us. Um, if you're not sure you need to update it, you can call the registration department to update that. Um, you can continue to practice during your audit process. So even if you went to further information, for example, and we kind of went back and forth the assessors a bit and things like that, you will continue to be registered and you can practice during that time. Any gaps larger than three consecutive months will need to be explained. So please, as mentioned, you know, if it was the ill health or for whatever reason it may be, please do explain that in your, in your CPD profile. And please don't send us any service user identifiable information. So when you are submitting your evidence, um, if there are any service user information named, emails, et cetera, please do redact them before you submit those documents to us. Next slide, please. Okay, so that's the end of my presentation. I'm going to hand back over to um, Emma. Hopefully that has reassured you and given you some more insight on CPD. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalie and Florence, for the, the, the things that you shared just before Natalie's presentation just now. Um, I think I'm speaking on behalf of all of us when I say that was really, really informative. Um, so thank you again for sharing that. I'm sure there's lots we'll all be taking away from it. Next up. We were really keen that you heard from, um, from an RCOT member who has been through audit before. I know for me, I find that extremely helpful and reassuring um, that someone's been through it and they've come out the other side. And uh, Denise is a senior occupational therapist working in an intermediate care team. And she's very kindly shared her personal reflections of going through CPD audit with us. Um, now I'm going to do my best to share her story with you today, um, but one of the quotes that really stood out for me from what Denise was telling us was, when I got selected for audit, I thought my occupational therapy career was over, but it wasn't, which is a good sign. Breathe, you have lots of time from being selected to the submission deadline. So Natalie's covered that a little bit already, um, and we'll come to that again in, in a while, but you, there is quite a nice period of time from being told that you've been selected for for, uh, for audit to then needing to submit your CPD profile. Now, Denise um, has continued her reflections around the theme of what, what she wishes that she had known. Um, and I think Denise's reflections really nicely echo a lot of what Natalie has shared just now. So uh, keeping a record or log of um, CPD activities, which is dated um, and doing that as you go puts you in a really good position if you're selected for audit and when it comes to beginning to compile your evidence. Uh, Denise's advice is if you haven't got one, don't wait to be selected, start it now and to link your evidence to the HCPC standards. Denise said, be creative with evidence in your CPD. So this, I think, touches on, um, again, what Natalie was saying around the different types of evidence you can provide. And Denise here gives an example of including evidence from others. So she says you could use written feedback from a student, for, ex for example, on your role as a practice educator working with them. Or if you've done a joint piece of work, you could ask for a witness statement from your colleague. So that's just about recognising that there are different types of evidence that you can use to, um, to demonstrate to HCPC that you're meeting those standards. Denise's uh, reflections, I think, really highlight here um, how supervision can count towards CPD. So when we seek advice and then we put that advice into practice with the person that we're working with, that can form part of our evidence of showing that, yeah, we, we've had a question, we've had a query, we've gone to seek some advice, and then we've put that into practice for the benefit of the person that we're working with. Denise shared with me that um, as soon as she thought about how her CPD was benefiting her work and the people she was working with, so her service users, clients or patients, we all use different terminology. But that's, that's the thing that made it feel so much easier to meet CPD standards three and four. Denise also said that she found the HCPC website very, very useful. There are lots of resources, as Natalie's mentioned, to support you through audit. And then something that I think is quite powerful is um, what Denise kind of said about the experience overall. 
it's not as bad as you'll think it will be. I actually found it affirming that my practice is as good as it should be. So I think that's really positive and a big thank you to Denise for sharing this experience with us. Um, something I wanted to add to those of you that are on the call, if you've been called for audit before as well, especially in more recent years, and you're keen to share your story with us, we're, um, we're, you know, we're wanting to sort of build some more stories around CPD audit to support you all. So, um, and I think it's really nice to hear those firsthand experiences from people going through it. So please do reach out to us if you want to do that. And you can get in touch using um, our professional development email address, which is prof.dev at rcot.co.uk. That's P-R-O-F dot D-E-V at rcot.co.uk. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Anne can't join us today, but I know that for this part of the session, Anne really wanted to bring um, the process that Natalie ran through kind of alive again from a slightly different perspective. So um, basically, if we all just imagine for one moment that we have just received the email, which lets us know that we've been selected for audits. So um, I think just something to point out here, I know we've said it a few times, these um, slides will be available and this webinar will, will be recorded. So if you do fast forward to August and you do receive an email, this is part of the presentation that you may want to come back to as well. So what Anne's done here very kindly is she's kind of put together a, a bit of a checklist and timeline that could help if you are somebody who is selected. So let's take ourselves to August. We've just received the email and a slight feeling of panic is totally fine. But remember at this point, there's lots of guidance and support available. Now, if you do need to request a deferral, um, it's a good, it's good practice really to do that as soon as you can. And Anne has talked here about checking your HTPC online accounts to check that it's activated and re-registering with HTPC in the normal way and paying the fee. So this is just echoing again what Natalie was saying, don't delay on the re-registration because then you prevent the risk of falling off of the register. Now it's at this point that you'll want to probably revisit your dated list of CPD activities and check that actually that's all up to date um, and that you've got that to hand. And again, this is a good time to take some time, if you haven't already, to look at the, both the HTPC and RCOT web pages. Um, there are so, I can't stress enough, there are so many useful resources on there. And um, what we're planning to do is following the session when we upload the webinar to the website, we'll also share a document with useful links to some of the key um, HTPC web pages that are available. We will also have um, a dedicated web page on the RCOT website, which I will share a bit more with you later. So these are the things that you might that you know might be good for you to get done and sorted during August. And then in September, perhaps that's the time to start to write your profile, checking that um, it meets all of the HGPC CPD standards. And if you aim um, aim to finish this, so set yourself a bit of a deadline, so aim to finish writing your profile and do any final checks and edits by the end of September, that then gives you plenty of time to submit your profile online. And you can do that in the first few weeks of October so that you're not leaving this to the last minute. So this is just, um, not everybody's the same. This won't necessarily work for everybody, but it's just uh, breaking it down, taking it one step at a time, and don't let that panic take over and stop you from kind of doing things um, step by step and, and getting your CPD profile submitted on time. So um, how will RCOT continue to support our members? Now, um, if you are selected for audit, we are absolutely here to support you. And uh, we have some plans to support our members moving forward in the lead up to obviously August and then in the period between August and October. So we are developing a dedicated web page which will have answers to frequently asked questions. It will have a recording of this webinar um, and we're building up some audit stories like I mentioned earlier from, from our members who've been through that. So we would absolutely love to hear from you if you want to be part of that. Um, we are also setting up some drop-in cafes, the idea being 
that if you're a member of RCAT and you've been selected for audit and you really want to connect with peers going through the same thing, then you could come along to the drop-in cafes, which um, we haven't got the details for right to share with you right now, but that will be following. So do look out for that, um, especially once you've been selected and that will be August onwards. We have our professional advisory service, which is a big member benefit. So do, do make use of that if you want or need to. Um, as part of this process. And don't forget that we have a range of CPD resources and events available on our web pages. So um, today is about really understanding the audit process and feeling prepared and supported for the upcoming audit. But it, it also might be prompting you to think about what different types of CPD can I engage in? And so do take some time to explore that because there are different types of CPD out there as Natalie's mentioned. And it might also be prompting you to think about the, um, the types of CPD or the CPD you're already doing that you don't quite realize yet. So Natalie's covered that and I won't repeat it too much, but do, do bear that in mind. Now, we aren't at the end of the session yet, but I think something we really recognise is the challenge of going straight back into work or life immediately after coming along to a session like this one. And something I'm passionate about is protecting a little bit of time during the session, so during the time you've allocated to attend, just to start that reflective process off. Um, so just as we're moving through the today's session, think about what is today raising for me? What's it bringing up? What questions is it bringing up? Obviously, we'll have questions and answers at the end, which we'll come to. Um, but what's it making me think about? How am I feeling about all of this? Now, we will all come away from today with our own thoughts and reflections, but all completely different. But I don't mind sharing that for me, I think that there's something about changing my mindset towards audit. So I think things like hearing that HCPC really want me to succeed, and hearing um, Denise's experience, for example, uh, makes me feel like this is more of an opportunity instead of a test. I think I'm guilty of in the past having that same feeling of, I really hope I don't get called for audit and will I, will I get through that? But actually, now I'm coming around to this uh, different mindset where this is an opportunity for me to showcase all of the CPD that I'm doing. Um, my commitment to lifelong learning and also a chance to demonstrate that I am meeting the CPD standards and for me to know that I am. So I think just turning that on its head um, is, is helping me to see things differently when it comes to audit. Perhaps today is prompting some or all of us to think about where we're at with our CPD right now. So what are the ways in which we engage in CPD and do or don't record it? Um, is there anything differently that we could do to embed good CPD habits, which work for us as an individual? What could I put in place to help me regularly engage in and record my CPD? So they can be these can be really simple things, and, and my answer won't necessarily work for each of you. Um, we're all different, like I just said, but is it that we set ourselves a reminder? once a month just to quickly you know have a look back through our calendars and update our dated list of the CPD we've engaged in that might not work for everybody I appreciate that but just have a think about what might work for you and then also just this concept of how can I move to a place where I do CPD because I want to and I really understand the benefits of it not simply just because I must do it because I belong to a regulated profession because the benefits of CPD are far and wide we know what they are but um I think that's just something else to think about. CPD audit is just some of us being randomly selected just to check check in that we're, we're meeting the standards we need to to keep those that we work with safe. Um, but actually, we would be engaging with CPD anyway. Part of reflection is thinking about what actions we might take. So um, this is also to do with actually applying any learning that we undertake to our practice. Um, and again, these are just suggestions of actions. You don't have to go away and do these, but these are just some actions that may help you to feel as prepared as possible. Um, and this is another slide that could be useful to revisit following the session when it's made available later this month. So checking that you have an online account and that it's working, looking back through your calendars to consider what activities you've done that count as CPD. 
uh, keeping your dated list of CPD activities up to date. So update it if it's not up to date. And then I think there's a lot to be said for talking to colleagues, sharing your CPD tips and experiences. I really do believe that we can be, as peers, each other's biggest inspiration and resource sometimes. CPD isn't something we have to do on our own. Um, there's a lot of benefit to learning with others. And I think being smarter with our CPD, so thinking about how we can record those things in a creative way, in a shared way, um, that means we are adding to our CPD evidence in a way that's not always creating lots of extra work. So taking time out with colleagues to reflect, I think is um, really valuable if you don't do that or you haven't done that in a long time. And then also we've mentioned this a few times, but you could take some time out to explore the HCPC and RCOT web pages. Um, something that I'm doing this year is I'm gonna have a go um, at drafting my CPD profile using HCPC's templates. Um, I've started this process already and just a personal reflection from me is that it really alleviated a lot of um, anxiety that I had attached to audit because it really does break it down and give you a very, very clear sort of structured approach and you know exactly then once you once you delve into it and you look at it in a bit a bit more detail then I know exactly what would be expected of me now so it feels a lot less scary and um, now many of you on the call are members if you're not then you could also join RCOT if you wanted to we have lots of different resources for our members and as I mentioned earlier we have plans to continue to support our members during um, this build up to audit and throughout the audit and re-registration process. So it's at this point that we'd quite like to um, ask you this question again. Again, this is going to be open um, until the end of the session. So um, you can either scan the QR code using a mobile device, or you can go to slido.com and enter the code 15946383. And just enter um, how you're feeling really now, now that you've heard directly from HGPC and perhaps it's just been a chance to um, think about this in a bit more detail and go a bit deeper with the details around what would be expected of us if we were to be selected for audit. And um, whilst you're doing that, I'm just gonna talk a little bit around the fact that, I guess as a tip really, <laughs> um, Natalie will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, the, what these questions will do is they're going to generate some word clouds, uh, so a visual word cloud, which demonstrates the sort of feelings that you're, you were feeling at the beginning of the session and how you might be feeling now. Um, and it's just a, a pointer, really, to say that any um, sessions you're doing with peers or CPD activities you're engaging in in team meetings and things like that, don't forget that you can use things like word clouds or other similar um, visual concepts like jam boards or a lot of us, you know, do a lot of things online and virtually, but, but think outside the box sometimes um, as ways to evidence your engagement or your reflection that are taking place during a session that either you're attending or that you're running yourself. Um, or it might be that you've done a team activity and that you want to sit down and do a shared team reflection on that. So what's gone well with this? What difference is this making to our practice and to the people that we're working with? What might we do differently next time? There's, you know, there's nothing to stop you doing that in very visual ways. Even if you're doing with that with pen and paper, you can take photos of that and, and upload that um, as part of your evidence to demonstrate the learning that's happening. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand over to uh, Florence now. Florence, I'm going to Emma. Move on to the next slide. Yeah, thank you. Um, so folks, all I can say is watch your takeaway today. And I know it's coming near lunchtime, so maybe we shouldn't have put that slide in. Um, but we have heard a lot of really good tips and guidance and resources about your, your CPT. And I really hope you do feel much better uh, about the prospect of, of getting chosen for audit uh, we'll know in a, in a short time when we look at um, your answers um, but I think it's important that you do go away now and reflect on what you've heard and actually I've just got to add I hadn't planned to add this in but just as Emma was reflecting on what she had learned um, as I said I had done a CPD audit and I actually enjoyed doing it I'm not normally um a saddle maybe you would think uh, but I enjoyed doing it and I think it was what I'm reflecting on is because I saw actually how my CPD helped 
the service user so much. And sometimes that was the service user being um, the rest of my team. And sometimes it was obviously the patients that I was seeing. So that was really encouraging because that's what CPD is all about. It's not about uh, getting picked for audit. It's all about making a difference to what you do. So um, I hope you can reflect on that. Um, next slide, please. So I mentioned um, the gap analysis tool, which you can use in relation to any topic, actually. But we have this one on our website uh, for you to use in relation to our updated standards. Um, so it does suggest that you would rate them uh, and then just review the changes and then summarize them. You know what it's like when you have to teach something um, or summarize it, you, it really gets into your head. So that would be the first thing. Just summarize it. Next slide, please. And then reflect on one that maybe you do really well and give an example. And we just find when you give an example to something like this here, it really brings it to life. It really makes it relatable. So think of an example for one you do well. Next slide. And then maybe one that needs a little bit of work. So if you're me, it might be the one around uh, the technology. Maybe that's not your strong point. Um, but as I said, just remember, it's not just about ticking a box to say that you've read them. It's about implementing them into your practice. So that's a useful wee tool that you might, you might like, and we'll have links towards that. And this is, oh, sorry, next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a quote that I, I really liked. Uh, we do not learn from experience. We learn from reflecting on experience. Uh, I think it's useful to remember, uh, but last night, Ashley was reading another book uh, about leadership. Uh, and if I'd read it a bit earlier, I would have put this quote in. Um, but the book's called Character Counts. And it talks about some well-known leaders in history. And it's said of George Washington, the, the first um, USA president, he says, he also analyzed and reflected at length on his failures. Instead of inwardly denying his mistakes, he treated each one as a progressive lesson, preparing him better for future challenges. And I think that's important too, um, that we can reflect on that too. Uh, next slide, please. So just a couple of other wee things uh, in relation to the HCPC. We're seeking feedback on proposed changes to the standards of conduct, performance and ethics for each of our 50 professions that we regulate. So these standards, as I said before, they set out the professional way that we expect our registrants to behave. Uh, our proposed revisions fall under five key themes. I'm not going to go into them now, but you can read about that on our website. But they include things like your duty of candor. And that's all about being open and honest with your patients when something goes wrong. I think it's something we can practice even doing at home too. Um, so this is a consultation. We want to hear your views and your feedback and uh, will be used to further develop the standards and the guidance on social media uh, before their, their final publication in September. So please go to our website, read up about the changes in the consultation document and answer the questions as best as you can before Friday the 16th of June. That would be really, really helpful for us. Uh, next slide, please. Now, we've already had a webinar on the improving the centrality of our service users. And today we're doing one on mental health. It's happening at the same time, mental health and well-being. So you can check those out as recordings on our website, but you can still register for the last three in our current series using this QR code here again or go onto our website. So that's, again, relating to our um, standards of proficiency updates. And tying in with these is our student competition, which went live yesterday. Uh, and this year, we're asking students to design a learning session about health and well-being for their fellow students. Uh, you can see last year's winner about Judy of Candor on our website too. So if you're a student yourself or you work with students in any capacity, please uh, encourage everyone to get involved. Um, there's a £300, £300 prize uh, and the closing date is the 3rd of September. Next slide, please. So as usual ways of getting in touch with us um, you can find us in all the usual places and we publish a lot of what we do and what's new on social media it's a great way to get or to keep it up to date with developments so um please think about that you can obviously contact us on the, um, via email on those addresses there uh, i'm at the professional liaison service and um, but if you're query links specifically to something in policy or registration or fitness to practice uh, you've got those specific emails there as well. well that's me thanks emma thank you uh, Florence, thank you for that. We're going to move on to question and answers very soon. 
but um, I just thought it'd be helpful. I'm not going to share the visuals yet, that we'll be uploading those afterwards, but I just thought it was quite powerful to share with you some of the Slido results just before we move on to um, the question and answer uh, session. So in response to the very first question, which was, how does the HTPC CPD audit make you feel? Um, there were lots of really common words. Now, I'm not going to, uh, there's no way I can cover all of them because lots of you engaged with it, which was absolutely brilliant. But some of the really, really key words that came up time and time again were anxious, nervous, apprehensive, scared, overwhelmed, worried, and underprepared. So I think what's what's nice about that is um, a sense of togetherness no, like nobody's alone in the way that they're feeling and that's obviously how we were feeling at the beginning of the session so once um we heard obviously from hgpc and, and they shared some uh, natalie and florence have both shared such useful information today again i can't possibly cover all of these different things but there's been some really really interesting comments and i think powerful comments about just the change um, once we've heard direct now that we've heard directly from HTPC. So um, people just saying they're feeling very reassured um, and actually this has provided quite a lot of up to date information that people feel kind of less worried and a bit more sure around what to expect in the future. There are other feelings that have been shared, such as less stressed. I feel like I have a plan and I know what I would need to do if I was selected. Um, I feel inspired and agree that audit is about showcasing what I'm already doing and the effort that I'm putting into my CPD. We've got feelings such as more relieved and more relaxed about the process um, and feeling more informed with some anxiety still. So we don't expect it to go away entirely. But I think what's really nice is that this is this is a lot of information for us to share with you. Um, but it will be recorded so you can revisit it and there will be the slides being shared with you and perhaps this is something that you want to um, talk to other colleagues who haven't been on the call today and revisit that information with them um, but we are we are all here to continue to support everybody through this process so I hope that's helpful just to give you a bit of a taste of the sorts of things coming through and like I said we'll follow that up as part of the responses. Now I'm going to have a look at the questions that have come in um, we've got a few and if we don't get to them all then uh, we will follow up again with that following the session so um natalie i'm going to direct this one to you we've got a couple of um, questions around the theme of being off on maternity leave and then um on long-term sort of sick leave only just coming back to work so what happens then now i think you covered it but if you could just reiterate that because we've had a few questions like that that would be great thank you Thanks, Emma. Sure. Um, so just just to reassure, I mean, we do have the deferral process, which I mentioned. And I mean, simply what that would be is that you would explain your situation and your circumstances and support that with evidence. So things like long term sick and maternity are definitely I mean, because we look at these on an individual basis, I couldn't confirm explicitly, you know, that your audit would be deferred. But things like that maternity and um, sickness are definitely kind of considered as reasonable reasons for deferral which means then you'd get picked up in two years time what I would say is you know everyone's got different personal circumstances so if you are worried about doing all at this time around please do reach out to us and we can have that conversation with you and provide advice and you know anyone is open to submitting a deferral and and they will you know it will be considered and looked at but just think about you know it may be that you just need a bit more time rather than deferral and then we can look at potential extensions as well so yeah if you are worried just just speak to us and hopefully we can find a resolution that's really really helpful thank you natalie and um, i've got another question here which is around um feedback being classed as i think evidence towards cpd so could i include client feedback with their permission Natalie, I think that one will be for you. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Emma. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we do have registrants who provide feedback. Um, it may be from their service users. Um, the only thing I would say is obviously just ensure that the feedback is redacted. So if their name appears or their email, but the actual feedback itself can definitely be used as part of your CPD evidence. That's amazing. Thank you. 
Um, and another one here, so again, I think Natalie, this would be for you, but does each individual CPD activity have to benefit both the client and us as a therapist, or can one piece benefit me, but maybe not as much for the person that I'm working with? Sure. So what you're going to find is that some of your CPD may benefit you and your service user, same, some may benefit yourself um, but maybe not so much a service user or vice versa, or actually you might find that a piece of your CPD actually hasn't benefited you at all, but that's all part of the learning and reflecting of the CPD that you're doing. So, you know, there's no right or wrong here. I mean, what I would say is the if you are selected, the four to six um, activities that you do pick, probably pick your stronger activities. So probably the ones that have benefited you and what you would normally find if it has benefited you in turn, it has benefited your service user, but there is no right or wrong. And you will find that, I mean, we've had profiles where, you know, veterans mentioned I'd done this activity and actually I didn't get what I thought I was going to get from it. However, they reflect and they have learned something. So yeah, ha really have a look at your activities and probably pick out your stronger four to six activities if selected. That's good advice. Thank you. Um, so, I know this seems like a bit quick fire, but I've got another one. <laughs> We've got a few here. So this one, um, again, Nat Natalie and Florence, this might apply to both of you, so let, let me know which one of you wants to answer it. But it's just about somebody who deferred their CPD audit last time, so will be due to submit this coming October. Can we confirm that the CPD will be marked against the old standards? So I think what this person's asking is about the changes to the standards of proficiency. Um, so if we could just clarify that, that would be really good. Um, I think Natalie mentioned both. that, yes. <laughs> so Natalie, yeah. I'll let you mention, because you, you talked with that already, actually. Thanks, Florence. Um, so what I just kind of want to emphasize here is that the um, standards of proficiency are changing, but the actual standards of CPD are not. So your profile will be assessed against the CPD standards. So actually um, it's the same standards that they will be assessed against in terms of the standards you know, for CPD. So if you have deferred and you're, go you're going to be picked up this time, then have a look at the CPD standards because that's what the assessors will be assessing your profile against as opposed to the standards of proficiency. I mean, the standards of proficiency, the changes will come in from September, but again, they are separate to the, the CPD standards, but obviously you still need to make yourself familiar with the, the changes of standards of proficiency. So I hope that just reassures you a little bit there. That makes sense, thank you. Um, so we've got a question here relating to those who were redeployed during the pandemic and for people whereby during that time their training was frozen. Um, and the person's saying that the in this situation, it wouldn't be the registrant's fault that there's sort of a limitation with engaging in CPD there. So how would HUPC accommodate for that? Sure, and um, thanks Emma. So what I would say about this, obviously when you, if you are selected, you know, your summary of work, you would detail if there was a redeployment, um, and that you may not have had much exposure to kind of um, maybe some of the CPD resources you had previously. The one thing I do want to point out here um, is that it is the on the onus of the resident themselves to ensure they're doing their CPD. So although we encourage employers to support their members of team and their, their employees, um, it is actually the responsibility of the registrant. So it may be that you didn't have exposure to as many formal courses, for example, or training or formal training. Um, but it still could be that you, there was self-directed learning that you were doing during that time. So you can explain that in your profile and your summary of work um, and have, a, you know, explain to the assessors that your role did change throughout that, that two years and the reasons why and they will consider that. And also if there are gaps larger than three consecutive months as mentioned, um, you can explain the reason for those gaps. But I do want to just emphasise that it is the responsibility of the resident as opposed to the employer, but we are mindful that when things change and you're redeployed and things, it can cause a lot of stress and changes. So that, that obviously is considered, but you know, this is why we've kept the CPD standards quite um, broad and the different types of activities quite broad to give the registrant opportunity to do different types of CPD. That's really helpful. Thank you, Natalie. Now, um, we've got one here, which is about if you take time off between jobs owing to health issues, 
where do we make note of that within the CPD profile if we don't necessarily wish to defer? Oh, I'll jump in there. <laughs> Thanks, Emma. So um, if you are, if it's a gap, you can explain that in your profile. So it could just simply be that within your dated list, um, <clears throat> there will be kind of a clear gap of your non-CPD. So you could mention in there the reason for the gap and then just emphasize that in your summary of work. So just explain that, you know, as you can see in my dated list between let's say January and April, there's a four month gap there. The reason why is because I was off of ill health. So they can consider that um, as part of the assessment when they're looking at your profile. Yes, thank you, Natalie, for that. And apologies, most of the questions are coming your way. But we, we have one actually that I can answer, which is, um, do we need to be RCOT members to access the drop-in cafes and professional advisory service? So the answer to that is yes, those, um, those things specifically are a member benefit. So members of RCOT would have access to those. Um, but if you're not, then the, this webinar is the, is the thing that we're doing to kind of benefit all and it will be recorded and, and that will still be accessible following the session. So I hope that answers your question. Um, now, we've got another question here, I think, which is around a possible time extension. So Natalie, this might be coming back to you. If someone's away um, on an extended trip, so this is a six week trip, um, would it then, would that be reason enough? Would that be possible to apply for a time extension based on that? Thanks, Emma. Um, yeah, so if it's during the period of obviously, um, you have August to um, <clears throat> obviously the deadline, the three months that we're giving you, if you feel that you do need more time for maybe the reason that you've just mentioned, we would advise that you email us um, at the, we'll provide the email, but it's CPD profiles at hcpc-uk.org and um, just explain your situation and actually stipulate in how much more time you feel you'd need. And then that would be considered by myself and the team um, if it was kind of deemed reasonable reason. I mean, we will obviously do our best to support you. What I would say is that sometimes people put off the profile a bit and kind of try to extend and then it becomes a bit more of an ordeal than maybe it should have been so obviously we do give the initial three months but by all means if you feel you need more time do email us and we can consider that absolutely um we've got one here about where we find the the hepc cpd profile template and also where to access the standards. So um, I'm obviously not from HGPC, but just to share my experience, it's it was really, even if you just do a simple search for HGCP, HGPC CPD standards, it comes up readily. And, and also on the website, I explored the sample CPD profiles and that's where I found the template. But Natalie and Florence, do you add to that if there's anything useful that you can, can give to that person? Oh. I think we will send out uh, a little document with links in it so they that should be in the the links document again just as you're chatting I have just done the search as well and just put in CBD template and they come up straight away and um, so it's it's actually quite an easy um, website to navigate around and the standards as well just along the top bar of the and um, the home page you'll see a whole section on standards and all the various links to changes that I mentioned um, and various things like that there. So what's all there? Any problems though, just contact us and we'll help you out. Thank you, Florence. We've just got a question here from somebody who wants to check the dates that the audit covers. So um, is it ever, is it, is the period that we need to evidence from the 1st of November, 2021 to the 31st of October, 2023? Yes, so that's correct. So yeah, the 1st of November 2021 to the 31st of October 2023. I'm saying it allowed to make sure it's correct. But yeah, that's the two year period if you are selected. I mean, what I would say is that obviously, if you submit your profile prior to the 31st of October, the deadline, then we're not expecting to see CPD for the period. You know, if you've done it two weeks before the deadline, then obviously you can't put something in you haven't done yet so um but yeah that would be the two-year period so anything before that date we don't want to see in the profile that's really useful thank you natalie uh, we have one here which is relating to um sort of making things anonymous uh, making things anonymous so when writing a summary of recent work do we have to make that anonymous and we've got another question natalie 
sort of linked to it, but more about client details. Do all CPD activities have to have definite proof? For example, we cannot disclose client details in reflective practice. So two slightly different questions, and I can break those down again, but would you be able to come back on that, please? Um, yeah, so I think the first one was um, basically in the summary of work. So the only things we really need redacted is if you were providing evidence that had, for example, if it was feedback from a service user and it had their name on it, for example, or their email address, then we'd ask that you redact it. Obviously, anything with your name or email, things like that, doesn't need to be redacted because that's your individual personal information. Um, so whether it be, obviously, we don't need evidence for every single piece of your CPD either. So it's only for the four to six activities that you pick to discuss in your profile that we want to see evidence for. So, again, you know, what I would also say is that if it's something in the public domain, it doesn't need to be redacted. So, for example, if you were providing presentation styles that are actually out there in the public domain and have different presenter names on it, for example, including yourself, then that doesn't need to be redacted because it's in the public domain. So it is more around, you know, um, using your judgment around kind of if something is confidential, but it provides good feedback for you and you want to use it as your evidence, but it has your service username on it to redact that. So I don't know if that answers both the questions that. Yeah, I think so. The first one was linked to the summary of recent work. That's the person's kind of um, summary of their work, isn't it? To let the assessors kind of get to know who they are, their scope of practice, that kind of thing. So that's slightly different because that's about you. And then, like you said, the second part is just making sure we remove any identifiable client information from any of the evidence that we're including. And um, so, yeah, I think that answered the question. Hopefully everyone's agreeing with that. Um, we've got quite a lot of questions coming in still and I'm I don't think we're going to cover them all so I'm just going to have a quick look down at the ones that are coming up most frequently and then any that we can't cover today we will um obviously follow up on we've got one here that says um can you please clarify the more than three month gap are you expecting evidence to cover the whole 24 months with something at least every three months yeah, so what the assessors are basically looking at in your dated list, they don't want to see any gaps larger than three consecutive months. So if there is a gap, when you're putting together your data list or you're looking at your data list before you submit it, if you notice, for example, there's a gap larger than three consecutive months, then you will need to explain why there is that gap of no CPD being done. So it's not so much about the evidence, because the evidence, again, we're only looking for evidence to support the four to six activities you're reflecting on but it's more in that dated list. Is there gaps? And if there is, what are the reasons? And to explain it in that data list and maybe your summary of work, why there are gaps. So there could be a different, you know, you've gone away long-term holiday if you're lucky enough, or it could be that ill health or something, you know? So yeah, just to explain to the assessor, otherwise what's more than likely going to happen, they'll come back with further information to ask why there's a gap and what are the reasons. That's, that's really clear, thank you. Um, and then we've got a couple of people asking about the timeline between submitting a CPD profile and then when the outcome is communicated back to that person. Sure, so um, we have um, our service level is 60 working days. So within that three months, I mean, we try to turn it, things around as quickly as possible. And now we've moved things online. It does allow us to work more efficiently. So. That is the time frame we say, but I mean, me and the team do work really hard to get those first decisions out as quickly as possible because I am mindful that registrants are naturally quite anxious of the outcome. So uh, we say 60 working days, but it, it could it could well be sooner, um, just depending. I mean, this is why also it is good to not necessarily wait right to the deadline because then you get that kind of bulk of submissions right at the deadline. So. If you are quite keen to get a decision back sooner, probably the sooner you send it in, the, the better. And we can get that turned around, hopefully a bit quicker for you. That sounds good. Um, there's one here. I think I know the answer to this one. So I might answer it, Natalie, and you can tell me if I've listened and I've, and I've heard it all right. But does, does um, each evidence need to be 1,500 words? Or is that for all four to six pieces of evidence that you're exploring in total. So I, my, my understanding, but I might be wrong, this is learning for me as well, and this applies to me, so it's good for me to know, but um, is that that part of the statement is, is a maximum of 1500 words for that part of 
the portfolio. Does that make sense? Yeah, so first of all, the 1500 is just kind of a recommendation. So please don't worry if it's under or over. And the 1500 is recommended for all for you to reflect on all four to six pieces of activity. So it's not per activity, otherwise the profile will be very large and it will take you a lot of time. And I don't think you'd be able to write 1500 words probably for every single activity anyway. So it's just to give you an idea that in that section, when you're reflecting on your four to six pieces of activity and how it's benefited you and the service user that around about 1500. And the reason why we've done that is because the question was always coming up around, how much do you want from me? How much do you expect? So we've looked through all of our profiles kind of over the years and it kind of roughly is approximately around 1500 thereabouts um, on like good quality profiles. So, but again, please don't worry if it's a little bit less or more, you won't get penalized for that at all. Okay, thank you. And I think the final question we have time for, because we've got something else to cover just before we close the session. And there's a couple of questions of this theme, but essentially it's what happens if you're working in either a brand new field or a very niche area of work where formal training might not exist yet. Um, so could if you've be if you're if you're in either of those roles or like working sort of slightly out there where you don't have formal training linked, um, could you use things that you've done? Like one one person on here gives an example that they've helped write national guidelines or in a program. So they could use that towards their evidence, which I think the answer is a big yes, but I'll I'll let Natalie confirm it. And the other thing is if if you're in quite a niche area um, then and there's no formal training around that, my take on that, Natalie, would be that to explore all of the other learning that you're engaging in, are you maybe reaching out to connect with others in, in that niche field or what self-directed learning you're doing, like all the other different types of CPT activities that exist? Yeah, definitely, Emma. I think you're spot on there. I mean, what I would say is that, you know, we really try to emphasise the point that formal learning is just one type of CPD. And I know it's the one that people kind of think, oh, that's definitely CPD because you do your formal learning and say you get a nice certificate. But actually, there's so many different ways of doing CPD. And like you said, self-directed is one. I would encourage you to have a look at our activities on our website. Um, and have a look at the different types of activities because you'll probably find some of the things you're doing are really promoting your CPD and they're not formal learning related. And also, I mean, being involved in kind of um, national guidelines, you know, absolutely kind of what research went into that, thinking about what you've learned from that, what you shared with others, you know, absolutely, I'll say that'd be deemed as a CPD. So have a look at the list on our website. I think it's quite thought provoking to have a look at the different activities and different types of activities to get you thinking about that. So formal learning is only just one, so. That's really helpful, thank you. Now, there are several questions we haven't had time to respond to, but we will follow up in the resources that um, go alongside the recording of this webinar. So thank you, everybody. There's been lots of questions, which is really, really good. And um, something we just want to ask before you leave today, if you can, we have um, an evaluation form and we'd really love to hear what you thought of today's session because it really helps us think about how we can continually improve future events similar to this one. Um, you can scan the QR code, it's anonymous and it doesn't take too long to complete. There's lots of drop down options on there. So if you can, then we would really, really appreciate um, your views and your thoughts on the session today. And I'm sure you'll all join me in saying an absolutely huge thank you to both Natalie and Florence today. It's been really, really good to hear directly from HCPC and for you both to share all of your knowledge and expertise with us um, and help us to feel really supported in this process. I know I do and I really hope I'm speaking on behalf of lots of people on this call. And whether you're watching this live or you're watching it back, um, big, big thank you from all of us. So um, I'm going to leave this on the screen just for a couple of minutes before we close the webinar and you, this will remain open again. So if you don't have time to complete it now, then you can revisit that if you want to. And um, just to echo what Natalie said earlier, thank you for coming. You can use attending today as one of your CPD activities on your list and we'll be sharing those word clouds with you. So perhaps that might be some evidence that you want to use with it, but remember to record the CPD that you're engaging in and reflect on it um, so that you're in a really strong position if you're selected for audit. Thank you everyone for attending today and that brings us to the, the very end of the session. I did enjoy